chapter 4. Head that way. Hebrews chapter 4. I'm trying to wrap this up today. Maybe I can. Uh, we'll start up there in the verse 8 of Hebrews chapter 4. Remember what we're talking about? We're talking about the rest of God here. We're talking about God's giving Israel rest, tried to give them rest in the land of Canaan, but they disbelieved and didn't want to cross over, and worried about the giants. They didn't believe God was giving it to them, so God didn't give them the rest. He put it off, or in other words, it was continual rest. And Canaan was their sign, it was their sign, their point of rest. They'd just come out of slavery for 400 years. God's about to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, right? It's just uh, outrageous how much food is grown on that land, it's still to, even to this day. Uh, but he's given them this land. There's giants in the land. They say, oh, we can't do it. They can't do it. So they didn't believe God. And by their disobedience, remember, they wandered around that desert on the other side of the Jordan River for 40 years until that whole generation died off. And so we, it's, this is what the writer of Hebrews is putting together here for these people to tell them God's rest is still available. Israel did not actually receive it. They had to wander in the desert. They went across 40 years later. Joshua led them across the River Jordan into the promised land. And they took it by war, they took it by battle, they took it by bloodshed, if you will, but they eventually got to that rest, but it wasn't complete, was it? It wasn't a complete rest, like maybe it would have been if they'd have crossed over the first time, right? If they'd believed God the first time and not wait 40 years to go across. But you'll see this here in these verses, so I want to, uh, I'll just give you a backup on that of what that's all about. But look in chapter 4, verse, starting with verse 8 through 13. It says, For if Joshua had given them rest... God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for God's people. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one will fall by following the example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword, it penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. All right, let's break this down a little bit. We can come short of God's rest. Now, rest is not his salvation. It's not eternal life. It's not that. It's, it's God's rest is available to me and you now. Remember what Jesus said. Come unto me, all who are weary, and I'll give you what? Heaven? No, rest. I'll give you rest. This is a spiritual thing. Rest does not mean that we're inactive. It does not mean we sit down like a couch potato and do nothing. It's not, it's not that at all. The rest that God gives us is a supernatural, it's a spiritual rest. You will be rested. Isaiah even said it, they that wait upon the Lord shall what? Renew their strength, right? What strength? Physical and spiritual. That wait upon the Lord shall renew their, and they shall fly... Come on, come on. They shall fly like what? Eagles, right? They shall rise up and mount up like, like eagles, right? So we, boy, this is going to be fun. Anyway, so uh, we see that that rest is set up that way. Let's see if I can get it to stop. Anyway, so we see that it actually, never mind. <laughs> Plan B, hang on. That's why this mic is sitting here. There we go. Plan B. Y'all hear it? You good? Okay, good cut that thing off i don't know what some kind of interference y'all playing on your phones out there or something that's probably no anyway all right uh so we see that rest actually exists it still exists to this very day because today would be the day of what salvation wouldn't it so that rest is available that and, and then understand this you do not get to experience this rest until you experience salvation he, he promised that those who disobeyed would never enter his rest remember just a few verses back, he's talking about the Hebrew children coming across. They would never enter Canaan. They would never enter his rest because of disobedience. The most disobedient you can be is to reject God's salvation. Bottom line. You'll never experience his rest. You'll never experience eternal life until you've given or surrendered your soul, your life to Jesus Christ, receive him as your Savior. Until then, you can forget it. There will be no rest. You might have physical rest, but you'll not understand what spiritual rest is all about. Nor will you begin to understand what the scriptures are saying. It always amazes me to listen to people who are not saved try to explain scripture. Doesn't work, does it? And you've seen it. You've seen it on national TV before. When a president would get up and try to explain Old Testament scripture, and you know the boy ain't saved, right? You know the guy's not saved. He's trying to explain who God is, and it's like, whoa, buddy, you're way out of line there. You know, you don't know what you're talking about. 
And so if, if you're going to explain God's word, you're going to understand God's word. First of all, you've got to be a child of God. The only thing the word of God does for a lost, generated, ungenerated person is bring them into regeneration. That's how they understand the word of God. It says, come, receive, come and believe, doesn't it? That is what the Holy Spirit uses as the word of God to draw them into salvation. Once you've come into salvation, once you've come into the kingdom of God, once you become a child of God, then the whole book opens up, doesn't it? The whole thing opens up and the Holy Spirit begins to teach you all things. He takes you through that scripture for correction, for reproof, for whatever you need, right? Encouragement and teaches you that scripture as you go. As I said before, there's some scripture you probably read 20 years ago. You'll read it tomorrow and go, whoa, I didn't see that. Why? Because it's active. It's alive, isn't it? It's not a dead book on, with printed words on page. It is alive and active. And the more we grow toward God, the more we understand God, the more we keep digging, the more we keep knocking, the more he sh what? shows us and opens up, doesn't he? The more, the more you are at, at, at uh, uh, progressing, <laughs> that's the wrong word. The more you are aggressive getting into the word of God, let's put it that way. The more you dig, the more he shows. So we need to understand that as we grow in the Lord. So God's rest, it's not a fable. It, it truly does exist. There's about five things here that prove it exists. First, first fact is that God rested after creation proves there's a God's rest for God's people. He created six days. On the seventh day, he did what? He rested. That word rested of what God was talking about didn't mean he became inactive. He looked at completion. He looked at creation completed, and he rested and enjoyed what he had done, what, what had been created. And he gave man a Sabbath rest. He gave man a Sabbath rest, too, to rest from his weary work, the actual physical work during the week, take a day off. I can tell you right now, people that don't do that, people that work seven 24s, right? They don't last long, do they? Your body needs to stop. It needs to rejuvenate. It needs to rest at least one day out of that week. Not making a religion out of it. I'm just saying God designed us that way, that one day at least, maybe two if you get a chance, you, you relax and, and slow it down and relax in the Lord. We take it and call it, well, they call it a Sabbath back then. We look at our Sundays as being our Sabbath. You might say, come and worship the Lord. Come and gather together. Uh, do as, uh, most of us do as little as possible, right, <laughs> on a Sunday. Try not to get too physical. And all, but we're trying to rest, get ready for that next work week. Once we retire, you don't really retire. I know. I can see your faces right. We don't really retire, brother. We might quit going to and checking in a job. But, boy, it gets busy after I retire, right? Yeah, I see your faces. I know what you're saying. Anyway, so the fact that God created heavens and earth and then he rested on the seventh day means he enjoyed his creation. He stopped his work. He stopped working in creation. It was finished. It was done. Uh, the sense of satisfaction, he rested in that satisfaction. Uh, we see God's rest in this verses here in uh, verse 5 and 6, talking about God's promise to Israel. The promised land Canaan is proof that there's rest for God's people. Canaan is an example of that. Canaan is not heaven. It's an example of God's rest to his people. And so, therefore, we see that it existed even then and even still today. Since Israel did not enter, the only conclusion that could be drawn is God's rest still exists. And I look at that as being, yes, absolutely it does. You look at it in our covenant and in the New Testament time, we see that God's rest exists in Jesus Christ. The only people that are going to be at rest are going to be the ones where? In Jesus Christ. When you get saved, you are placed by the Holy Spirit in Jesus Christ. You are contained, you're covered by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. It's a guarantee upon our life, right? That you're covered. You are also placed in or baptized in. It has nothing to do with water. Baptized into Jesus Christ. So therefore, you're in the vessel. You are in him, and he is what? In you, isn't he? By the Holy Spirit. And remember where Christ is right now. He's seated at the right hand of God, interceding for who? Us, right? But where does he do his work? Through us. He's still active. He's still not just sitting down resting couch potato. He's active, actively working through his body, the church, even to the very end of time. He's going to be active in us. And so <clears throat> we see that that rest is, is given by him. Believers can still enter that rest. God's promise of a new day in verse 7, his promise of a new day to David proves there's a rest for God's people. He said, then there's another day called today. If you hear God's voice, heed the call, right, to come and rest. You heed the call, and that's what he's saying. God still existed in David's day 
500 years later. This is before Joshua. This is before crossing over. From that moment till David came into the thing, you check your timeline. 500 years later, God says to David, there's still rest. There's still rest in me. And he said, today is that day. God promises another day in verses 8 and 9. He says, another day, even the days of Joshua, proves there's a rest for God's people. Another day. We call it today. We would say today is the day of salvation. Don't wait till tomorrow. To, I mean, yesterday's gone. Don't try to wait till tomorrow. Don't try to wait till your prime opportunity to come to Christ. You come when God calls. You come when the Holy Spirit draws. You see, I think there's thousands upon thousands of people, and especially in the Baptist church, who sat through many an uh, uh, invitation song time when we used to do, uh, what was it, Just As I Am 15 times, right? And try to get an invitation going, and they sat and they gripped the chair, gripped the pew, man, let me get out of here, and the Holy Spirit was drawing them, and they kept saying, nope, 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 I'm not ready yet, I'm not, I'm, I want to sow some more wild oats, whatever the reason was, I'm not ready to do this. And I believe they passed their day up. I believe they have passed their day up, and now they're callous to the point that they're not even in church, not even doing anything, they're totally into the world, right? At one time, maybe been coming to church, totally into the world, and now their day might have passed. But then again, God, remember, but God, his grace could come in at the last second, too. It could come in at the last second. Don't forget that. God is God. He can do what he wants to do. Amen? We don't control him. We don't tell him how to do it. But I'm telling you, he offers today to be the day of salvation. And you can look back in your own life and realize, oh, yeah, I had a couple of chances. A couple of times I turned and walked away. A couple of times I didn't want to have anything to do with it. And God kept coming. God kept chasing. Amen. He kept running for us. And finally we turned around and surrendered one day. and said, yeah, I am a sinner. I do need a Savior. Forgive me, Lord. And we repented. We, we repented of our sins. We repented of who we were, what we were doing. And God graciously forgave us and said, come on in, son. Come on in, daughter. Come on, you're mine. Come on. And we started following him. He proves there's another day coming. God's rest exists also in another day in verses 8 and 9 there. You see he has another day coming, gives it to David 500 years later. Also in verse 10, the rest of Jesus Christ from all his work proves there's a rest from God. What did Jesus do after he had completed salvation's work, was resurrected from the grave? 50 days he stayed upon, or a few days after, 40 days after that, he stayed upon the earth seen by 500 plus people at one time many people saw him resurrected what did he do when he ascended from the ground and went back into the heavens he was seated where at the right hand of god his place his majesty his glory he's seated there even right now at the right hand of god and he's waiting on the father to say go get your what bride didn't he remember the show remember the picture of how that worked how the bride of christ worked? he's waiting on the father to say now son go get him and it's going to happen in a moment. It's going to happen in a twinkling of eyes. It's going to happen when we are least expecting it. Amen. Even the church is going to be least expecting it. Boom, there it will come, just like that. The world won't know what happened. But we, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, will be changed from mortality into immortality and meet him in the air, right? That's exactly what Thessalonians said. That day's coming. I, I say that day's coming because everything this Bible has predicted has been 100% accurate on the money. And those days are coming because it said this will happen in the end. This will happen in the end times. Christ will come for his church. Those in the graves will come up first. Then those who remain, us standing on the ground, looking up at our salvation coming, right? We'll be caught up and meet him in the air. We call that the, the rapture of the church. Not the second coming, the rapture of the church. We'll be taken away to meet him in the air and forever, the scripture says, be with the Lord. Forever from there on. We will be with him. Got into a little revelation teaching there. But anyway, point being, get ready. Jesus proves there's a rest for us. When we enter God's rest, we no longer struggle with the trials and temptations of life. We start overcoming. I mentioned this last week, Romans 8, 37. We become what? More than what? Conquerors, right? He saved us not to cower down to sin, but to rise above it. He saved us not to cower down to Satan, but to stand firm against him, right? To stand in the battle. We, we studied about that throughout last week in VBS. All about the sword of the spirit. All about the armor of God. And standing firm in what you know and in who you are. You see many Christians today, and, and I've met uh, quite a few of them in the past, that the minute you mention Satan, they're like, oh, I don't want to talk about him. I don't want to mess with him. But look, you, you're cowering down to the bully whom has less power than you have in you. Because why? 
greater is he that's in you than what? He that's in the world. That scripture is not lying. You have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within you. You have God Almighty dwelling within you. That means you have the powerful one dwelling in you that's more powerful than that bully, right? More powerful than any other spirit in the world. Doesn't mean you stand up and make fun of the spirits. No, indeed. You don't make fun of angels. You don't make fun of the evil spirits. You just stand your ground and you fight the fight with the scripture. We talked about it this week in VBS 2, Matthew chapter 4. How did Jesus beat Satan in the 40 days of temptation? Quoted scripture, didn't he? He quote, word of God quoted the word of God. He quoted the very scripture he was <laughs> and it defeated Satan. He didn't look at Satan and say, you know who I am? He never said that, did he? You know who I am? I, I'm Jesus. I'm the child of the king. No, he didn't say that to Satan. He said, it is written. And then he would quote the scripture. Most of them out of Deuteronomy. You can look at it in Matthew 4. You can see it. He said it three times. It is written. It is written. It is written. Even Satan quoted scripture to him, tried to trip him up. Didn't work. Why? Because you can't trip up somebody that already knows the scripture. That's why it's important for us today, 2023, to know the word of God. Because there's going to be a lot of people come up with half the word of God in order to push their agenda on you. And you're going to say, that's not exactly true. What the word says is da 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 And you put it in its place. You put the truth out there. So we understand that that's, that also is what's happening in this situation here. Christ proves that is his rest. We no longer wrestle with our trials. He conquers. He triumphed over them. Matter of fact, he triumphed over the, the fear of death. I mean, as believers, we really shouldn't have any fear of death. It is our ticket, if you will, to cross over into eternity and face God. It is. Nothing to really fear about it. Those who are unregenerated, yeah, they fear death because they don't know what's coming. They might know what's coming. Many of them believe nothing. After this is over, nothing. <laughs> they got a rude awakening coming, don't they? Because everybody has an eternal life somewhere. Think about that. Everybody has eternal life somewhere. Is yours going to be with Almighty God, or is it going to be with the enemy? Or is it going to be in his location? It's going to be two locations, two people, believers and non-believers. So we see here that he says this, our rest, our struggle, just as Jesus makes us to become more than conquerors, therefore we walk in that and we strive in that. Now, if you go on down to verse 11, he says, look in there. He says, let's therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by the following the example of their disobedience. And notice the word effort in that verse. That is not earning your salvation. Effort is actually diligence. It's actually to be zealous, to endeavor, to, to exert oneself. When you get saved, do you still not have to be diligent and consistent about following Christ? Absolutely. If you're not, You'll fall by the wayside. If you're not diligent in getting in the word, digging, if you're not diligent in continuing in the word and digging, you'll grow away from it. It's the weirdest thing, isn't it? You'll grow away from it. You'll get away from it. If you're not diligent in saying, I choose to serve and I'm going to continue to serve no matter what happens, no matter who hurts my feeling at church, no matter who does this, does that, I'm following God, not man. If you set that standard at the very beginning and you follow that standard, you'll find that it's a lot easier to be connected to the vine. He says, if you stay with me, you've got to be connected to the vine. I'm the vine. You're the what? Branches, right? You disconnect from that vine. Guess what's going to happen? Slow death, isn't it? Slow death happens. Spiritually begin to die. Spiritually begin to be separated from God, if you will. Well, we need to understand that. That's what's happening in this situation here. The effort it's talking about is a disciplined effort, a determined, a consistent, focused on, as Paul would say, focused on the prize. Remember when Paul said that about I'll run the race, not just to compete, but to what? Win, isn't it? And we're in a race in our spiritual selves, if you will, in our life. We're heading toward eternity. If you want to compare Paul's thing about racing a race, he's talking about Olympic-style race. He said they run a race for a, a little crown that's going to deteriorate and go away. He said, but we run to gain the big prize, not salvation, but the big prize of what? We are storing up treasures in heaven. Paul knew that everything he did, he had to do for the kingdom of God. He's storing up treasures. Paul understood that today we're not running a race to gain salvation. We're running a race because we are saved. And we do these things and we store up treasures because we're already saved. Not to get saved. Many people have got that confused. 
and said, oh, you need to do Jesus and this. You got to have Jesus and this work and Jesus and this tongue and Jesus and this gift. And no, it's just Jesus, isn't it, church? It's just him. It's him. All him, all him about salvation. That's it. Just Jesus. So where does this other stuff come from? He didn't save us to do nothing. He saved us to do the kingdom's work. He saved us to be the body of Christ. He saved us to go out and tell and make disciples. He saved us to serve one another. He saved us to serve lost people in order to show them what the kingdom of God is like. That's the cold cup of water thing, right? That's just plain old being nice to somebody, right? Somebody you don't even know, even strangers. Matter of fact, we're warning the scriptures that be careful that you're good to all people because you never know when you're what? Entertaining a what? Angel, right? Be careful. Be good to all people. Be, be courteous to all. Let them see Christ in us. So that effort is not gaining it. That effort is just absolutely disciplined life, determined, consistent, not on and off again. We tend to, Baptists tend to say we backslide. That's when we're out. And then we come back in and we're up. And we backslide and we're out. You know, Israel did the same thing. It's nothing new under the sun, is it? Israel did the same thing. When God delivered them out of slavery, what happened to them? First thing they did, they went down, didn't they? They made a golden calf, started worshiping an idol, not God. Then he brings them out of that, and they went back up. You notice Israel goes up on a high plane for a while, and then they dive off into sin. They go what? Back into captivity for a while, don't they? That's their whole, their whole life has been that way. Israel is an example and a type of what happens to believers today. If they're not consistently on fire for God or on with God or in his word, you're going to have these down times where like, oh, uh, church doesn't do anything for me. You know, the Bible, I'm just reading, it's not doing anything for me. You're in the valley, right? You're in the dry place. There's a mountaintop coming, but if you can stay consistent, you'll stay on the high plains of your spiritual walk. You'll never drop down into the mud again, down into the valley. You'll stay up there. How? By being consistent, by being disciplined in your life to study his word, by being disciplined in your prayer life to knock and keep on knocking, ask and keep on asking, right? And never give up. I'm telling you right now, God loves that. We, we tend to think of our children, they keep coming to us, they're agitating or they're irritating us if they keep coming and asking for the same thing, right? Mama, 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 all over and over and over, right? We, we tend to think of that as an agitation sometimes. God loves that. He wants you to keep coming. He wants you to keep digging, doesn't he? He wants you to keep asking. He wants you to, it's not, not that you're lacking faith. He wants you to stay interested. He wants you to be diligent about what you want and the answer you're looking for. That just revs him up, man. He's like, yeah, I'm ready to answer you now. I'm, yeah, here it come. Now, here it come. Get ready, right? Because you're diligent, because you keep going. That's what this word is here. Make every effort to enter the rest so that no one will fall by following their example of obedience. Make every effort to enter that rest. In other words, we make every effort to make sure we, our salvation is real. Make every effort to make sure that we are in Jesus Christ and that it's all real. We don't want to fake, out, fake each other out, fake ourselves out, and then end up that day and God look at us and go, I don't even know who you are. You had, you had great attendance at church. You had this. You had that. You gave good money to the church. But I don't know who you are because I don't have a relationship. I don't know who you are. Make sure that relationship's right, folks. Make sure it's real. Because only you and only between you and God can you know that. And what does the scripture do for us? The scripture in John, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, The scripture is God breathe, useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Not in, not in religion, but in righteousness. Our lives after we get saved are to be lived in righteousness and toward holiness. Gaining that ground, moving in that direction, never moving back towards sin. God saved us in order for us to gain toward righteousness. He works us through the sanctification process, if you will, what we're going through now. Justification is done and over the moment you believe. Sanctification, this, this whole process of changing as we go. God chipping away that which is not like Christ. The scripture building us up from milk to meat. We begin to get stronger and stronger. We begin to understand more and more. We get off the elementary things of the gospel and start getting into the meat of the gospel. In other words, not talking about just basic stuff anymore. You start getting deeper and deeper and, and, and into the word of God and getting deeper and deeper with God theologically. So, yeah, the scripture is there for that. Matter of fact, Jeremiah 29, 23, 29 says, Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock into pieces? My goodness. The word of God is strong, isn't it, church? It's strong. 
for breaking down strongholds. It is strong for, for taking a heart of stone and melting it and bringing it to him, isn't it? The word of God, not us convincing people, but the scripture, the word of God, touching their heart, touching their heart. And, and that's where we get into this last thing here, too, about, um, oh, I'm sorry, I went too far. We get into the last thing here about the effort of God, about the word of God judging. If you look at those verses right there for just a second, it says, verse 12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Now notice something about that verse. Sometimes we read that wrong in our mind. We see the words, but we read it wrong. It did not say, and as many times this is the way we read it, it did not say dividing soul from spirit, did it? It said dividing soul and spirit. Even dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, not joints from the marrow. The word of God is sharper than a double-edged sword. It, it comes in. It's almost like it's like this. It's not coming in to try to chop one of versus the other off. It is the mind. Of, it is God coming in and separating what is actually flesh or spirit. Right. It just separates them. It doesn't separate them from each other. Only God separates the from. We have to discern which is which. In other words, the, the word, it judges our heart. The word of God judges our heart. You and I can't look at each other and judge our hearts because we don't know our own heart. We can't see that deep within ourselves, right? I can't see that deep in you. You can't see that deep in me. Meaning I can't tell. I don't know if you're really saved or not. Only you know that and God knows that. His word searches. His word divides that. Soul and spirit. Not from but what is done from the soulish or what is done by the spirit? As a matter of fact, when you are uh, judged on that day for your works, what will it say? It says that the works that are being judged, that which you think you've done for the kingdom of God, will be judged as if by fire. And that which remains is only the part that was done for God, only done for the kingdom. See, I'm afraid some of my works are going to be washed. They're going to be burned away. Why? Because I did them in flesh thinking I was doing them in spirit. Hey, I don't want to confuse you on this, but and especially in my position, being in a church ministry position like that, do I do what I do out of just duty or is it out of love for the kingdom of God? You see, God judges. it. That's what the sword of the spirit does. It judges between the two. He's looking even right now at all of us and looking at how we're thinking, all the thoughts and attitudes of man and woman and he's, he's looking at it and seeing what's going on and this word of God the sword of the spirit if you will is judging that is cutting is sharper than a two-edged sword it is dividing that which is soulful and that which is spiritual he knows in other words why you gave your offering he knows how you gave your offering he knows if you worship today or if you just went through the motion how does he know that word of God is sharp he can divide. He can discern. He knows exactly. He knows the hearts of men. Because if you look at that verse, that's the last part of it. It says, and the word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing the soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges, there's a word, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of what? Our heart. Us. He judges the thoughts and attitudes. I can't do it. I'm not God, but he does. He does through his word and he judges those attitudes and whatever, ever how we did something, whether we're doing it for the kingdom of God and storing up treasures in heaven or whether we're doing it for a pat on the back right here. He knows you can fake out all the people, but you cannot fake out God. That's the whole point of this thing right here. Your works is between you and God and he knows exactly why you did them or why you're not doing them. He knows he knows. And that will be our judge. We will lose reward there. If we did anything in our own flesh for our own reward. He warns us. He said that one has received their reward. They got the clap. They got this. They got whatever from the people. They got the praise of the people. That, that reward is done. But if they did this for the kingdom of God, for the sake of God, and nobody recognized it, then they've done it for God. There will be recognition one day, but not upon this earth for it. Up there for what took place. Word of God is active. It's got energy. It's living. It's active. It's not dormant. It's not just pay, uh, ink on a page. We know that. That's what I said just a moment ago. There's verses today you can read. You didn't catch it 20 years ago, but today you see it and go, oh, yeah, I get it now. I get it. Why? Because it's alive. It's active. 
and it's not changing. It's just opening our eyes to more truth of what's in there, isn't it? Word of God doesn't change. It's not going to change over theology-wise and say suddenly say, you know, Jesus is not, uh, it's got to be Jesus plus this or Jesus plus this. It's not going to change any of that. What it's going to do is open your eyes deeper to what God is doing. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It's penetrating. It separates the soul and a, a proud soul from an humble spirit. God sees down deep. He knows. He knows. And so we must not act like we're fooling God. We can fool people, but he knows. He sees. And he therefore takes care of those situations. And notice that I said he sees. That's the very last thing he says right here. Look at it in verse 13. Nothing in all creation is hidden from his sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. All of us are going to give account one day, right? We're not going to give account for our salvation. Jesus has already taken care of that. And, it, and God will know that we have received Christ. He'll see the blood of Christ upon us. He'll see salvation on us. What are we going to give account about? What do we do with this life after we gave our life to Jesus Christ? That's what we're getting accounted for, Christian. The rest of the world, lost world, is going to be, what did you do with your life I gave you even though you never came to Christ? What did you do that was good or bad? Because there's coming a day for that judgment, too, called the great, great white throne judgment, where all the dead will be raised and stand before the throne, and their deeds will follow them, right? Us who have believed in Jesus Christ, Ours is going to count for what happened after he gave us new life, after he gave us eternal life. Not our sins. Our sins are forgiven. Our past is over. It's done. Christ already paid for that. Whatever you did in the past before you were a Christian, blank. It's gone. It's only what happened after you came to Christ. What did you do? What, what did you do with your life? And you see that right here in this verse. Nothing in all creation is hidden. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him whom we must give an account. The last three words, must give an account, means everybody's going through it. Nobody gets a pass. Don't care who your daddy is. You're not getting a pass from God's judgment, from what he's going to do. But you and I, thank God, Christian, who believed, Jesus is going to be like our lawyer in heaven. Amen. He's going to say, Father, this, one, this one's mine. This is mine. This is mine. He's forgiven. He's forgiven. But that judgment is still going to come on our rewards. What will be burned away? What will be left? And what will be, remain for us to be used for whatever reason it's be used for? All I know is the scripture says, store up your treasures where? In heaven. Not down here. Not down here where rust can rust it away and moth can eat it up. Luke 12, 2 says, and I'll close here quickly. Luke 12, 2 says, there's nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. In that judgment, God is going to bring it all out because he's going to show you how forgiving the bottom line is, how forgiving he is of that. It, you, you'll probably look at that and you'll probably go through that and say, man, I don't even deserve to be here. God, I'm I am so sorry for all the stuff I messed up. Right. But you're going to experience grace one more big time. And he's going to look at you and say, come on in. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. But boy, what you could have done if you'd have put a little effort into it while you were there, right? That's what we're going to regret right there. What we could have done, what we were able to do, and we did not do it for the kingdom of God. I don't mean to bring you on a downer on this thing. I'm just telling you, folks, to be ready. Nothing is concealed from him. Ecclesiastes 12, 14 says, God will bring every deed into judgment, everything and according, including everything hidden, whether it's good or evil. He's going to let it be shown, let it be known. And then he's going to wipe away every tear from the eye, right? And a new heaven, a new earth, new, new beginning for all who believe in him. So Hebrews, the, guy, the writer of Hebrews here, the God's given us to this guy, trying to get to remember who he's talking to now. Brand new, born again, Jews and Gentiles, mostly Jews, who are wanting to go back to the old system. They're going through persecution. They're having a hard time with it. And it's much easier to go back to Judaism and just go, you know, kill some more animals, whatever, for sin instead of actually being accountable for what you're doing. Because Christianity does what? What, what happens in this life with us? It brings us into accountability, doesn't it? Not just bring an animal and sacrifice it for your sin once a year. It brings you into accountability every single day of your life between you and God. Not between you and me, but between you and God, you're accountable every single day. We start out every day. Asking for his mercy because we know somewhere along the way there's going to be a mess, right? <laughs> and we know it's going to happen. 
We know it's going to happen. God, give us mercy. God, give us the grace. And God, forgive me when I slip. God, forgive me when I fall. And raise me back up. Don't send me backwards. Send me forward. And keep sending us forward. I encourage you with that, folks. He doesn't tell you to go back to go and collect 200 or whatever. He's, he says, get up and go right where you are. And we've all hit our knees. We've all fallen. We've all been wounded or whatever. He says, get up. I forgive you. Move on. Move on. Time is short. We've got a little bit of time left. Amen. Let's get it done. Let's get up right where we are and keep moving forward in his kingdom's work. I encourage you to do so. Let me pray for you guys and let you go. Thank you for being here today. And I encourage you to watch for your opportunities out there now. Every, every moment, every blink of the eye, you may have an opportunity that's been set up from the beginning of time for you and you alone. And he wants you to work it. He wants you to do it. So watch for that throughout this week. Let's pray.